Good evening, good morning, and good night, wherever you are, and uh, welcome to another Animal Rights Show. Um, we haven't done one for a while, so we'll have to work out how to do it again, won't we, folks? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a bit shell-shocked. Hello, everyone. Greetings. Well, we were meant to do one a couple of weeks ago, weren't we? And then, um, I don't know, we've kind of been a little bit doomed, really, haven't we? So, yeah. one thing and another. It was event, events, dear boy, events, you know, that kind of thing that they say in politics. Oh, yes, you know, so, yes. yes. So uh, let's let's see who's in the house, as we say. So um, the spiritual vegan was first. Oh, had... badge, yeah. it's a badge. Yeah, <laughs> some badge. Um, you got Rich and then and then Jeremy the Ape from Respect Animal Sanctuary in sunny Georgia, which is just showing off. Yay. <laughs> Although um, it's been sunny Dublin today, but still cold. So, and sunny London actually a little bit. Is it? Yeah. yeah. What about sunny Athens, or is it? Is it still on fire, or? Oh, sorry, I was muted. I didn't realize. Uh, Athens was actually sunny these days. Uh, quite sunny. Um, we're back to 18, 19 degrees during the day, so it's more like spring. Uh, mm -hmm. right. So. Ah, well, we're all sunny then, except the temperature di are different. Uh, Deb says um, hello. Glad that Tars is back. Well, uh, tell hey. us in, that, in an hour's <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> we for, we've forgotten after it. Um, let's see. Uh, Terry is here. Terry. Oh, yes. Yeah. First time I've been here for a while. I was too, Terry, to be fair. <laughs> all right. And that's, uh, everybody else is having, having a... a, a a good old uh, chat and in fact um given that uh, the best uh, the best thing to interact with the show on in terms of getting involved with the chat is my youtube channel it is going out to um the vegan review facebook page and it's also going out to my facebook page but if you want to actually engage with the chat my youtube is where it's mainly gonna be and then Look who's here. sorry <laughs> Look who's here. <laughs> he oh. hasn't been on for a while either. Oh, he's, he's disappeared again now. Sorry. It's interrupt you, Raj. <laughs> it's, it's trying the, to get this. The Brian show's back. Brian show's back. But um, interestingly, Terry's, Terry, that must be a while since you were here. Terry's asking, no, Tom. Now, it must be at least two years since Tom was on the show. Was it a year and a half, two years it's or a, something? It's, like a, that? It's, a good, it's a good while, yeah. It's a long while, yeah. So, that, Terry, that must be a long time. I'm sure Terry's been here since Tom left. Maybe not. Yeah, I'm sure he must have been. Or is he just pulling our legs? Yeah, it's Terry. Probably, it's probably pulling, pulling our legs. <laughs> <laughs> and then, it's in relation to comments, people, just uh, comment away. Uh, we we don't we don't do all the super chat things, so we don't we don't make you pay to get your uh, opinions on the screen, and we will respond to anything that makes sense. <laughs> So if if we are also <laughs> making sense, of course. So that, that's that's the kind of caveat. Now, um, our special guest panelist is not here, been involved in a car accident. So, um, but Do you tell us more, Roger. Yes, he's still alive, to coin a phrase. In fact, Andy wasn't involved himself. He got back home in order to prepare for this. And some car has smashed into the Virgin Hub, it's called, which is a little box on the street, which serves all the um, the internet. So they've effectively put the um, the internet out in this area for however many days that's going to be. I mean, that's that's it. That's even better than my council because my council cut through my telephone <laughs> wire about ten days ago. That's one of the reasons why we couldn't go go yeah, live. Yeah, yes, that's one of them. Yeah, because the the thing is, I went I went down right, and they were working away, and I goes, "Have you are you guys just sliced through a, a telephone wire?" And he goes, "Oh yeah, I think so." <laughs> yeah, casual about it. <laughs> casual as you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, well, "Well, what are we going to do about that then?" Oh, we reported it to the council. <laughs> anyway, all's well that ends well. I, I ended up with a different provider which is faster and cheaper so that's pretty good oh there we go yeah. then good. the yeah, gift so, the gift in the shit as i like to call that doing what the gift in the shit 
Oh, oh, right. Okay. When something good comes out of a shitty situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we use a uh, silver lining, don't we, or something? Yeah. Oh, I'm from I'm from Lothar and Mother, what do you expect? <laughs> Many gifts must be coming our way then. It's, it's a bit more basic in Yorkshire. It is, lad. Yeah. <laughs> You, you you should have lost all that Yorkshire stuff now you've been down south with all the soft sudden uh, dot dot dot. <laughs> well, you, you know what they say, you can take the girl out of Yorkshire and all that, but... <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, that's oh, right. Deb's, Deb's much more um, refined than, than I. Blessing in disguise. Yes. <laughs> Blessing in disguise. Right, so we... we um. As you can tell by the way we did the ring, we had a packed show because of of Andy, and now we don't. And so, um, but we do have a couple of <laughs> we still got a couple of um, issues. Uh, one of which is um, Veganuary. We thought we'd have a little look at. I've got uh, feedback coming for you, Roger. Just as... before you carry on, I've got feedback. Is it anything to do with me? Because I can no, hear. No, I think I think maybe if you if you mute Nella, maybe. Ah, right. that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, why that I is. think it was that. Yeah, it might be because because the gain's high because of the the level. Okay, we'll uh, have to keep reminding you to to unmute, sir. Nella. So um, we'll, we'll we'll be there watching you move your move your mouth and you're on mute, Nella. We're on mute, Nella. We'll say, say that a few, a few times. <laughs> so oh, 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 was it me the the echo? Yeah, I think so. It yeah. stopped when we when you went on mute for me anyway. Yeah, we can all try. What, what about now? That's better. Did you turn the level down? Yes. I think that's I think that is it then. I think that was better. Okay. So this is the Veganuary website, which is um fairly kind of um, developed. Uh, and it's kind of like uh, what 10 11 years now uh veganuary so from my perspective it's had a it's had a bit of um you know an interesting uh, history because i've been um invited on to irish tv about three times now in fact it might be four now with this latest one uh to talk about veganuary and uh, a lot of people thought of it as um a bit of a new year's resolution um issue and one of the Irish journalists was very kind of um, critical of that uh, and just thinking that, um, I mean, I think she seemed fairly sympathetic to the cause and saying, well, it's just going to be, you know, lost, lost in, in everybody else kind of quitting drink and smoking for a, a month type of thing. Um, so, so there was that. And then the last one, um, I did an interview with a, a journalist called Jerry Kelly. I've been on his show a few times. And um, we'd put a press release out saying that um, it's important for the grassroots of the movement to make make it clear during Veganuary that veganism is not a diet, right? And his first question was, well, I was intrigued by your press release because veganism is a diet, surely. And so, you know, that was his first journalistic question. And, and that really goes to show some of the kind of problems, the fact that we're struggling at the moment in this movement to establish the fact that veganism is not a diet. And, you know, journalists think it is. Quite often you'll get advocates talking about, about, about it as though it is. And so it, seem, it seems to be a kind of general pop, uh, problem, you know. And um, it's almost like advocates need to go onto the media and spend as much time telling people what veganism isn't than about what it is, you know, which actually is not a bad thing to do, uh, funny enough, but that, that's that's a, a, another another matter. But, but yeah, this guy goes, well, surely it is a diet. I said, no, no, it's it's not. It's, a, it's an overarching philosophy which has got a dietary component. And so we kind of had to clear that that bit up. So I think I think those are the two kind of problems that I've always highlighted with veganuary it focuses on the diet and it also uh looks as though it's a new year's resolution mm. well funnily enough i heard um one of my clients the other day when we when we came back after the holidays and i heard her um 
chatting to a few of the people and saying, oh, I really don't know why everyone does this dry January and this veganuary stuff. I just can't see the point in it all. Just And, and she obviously then lump, was lumping it together with the dry January. So it's almost like, yeah, that's that detox kind of thing, isn't it? After indulgence and, you know, putting lots of rubbish into your body, it's seen as like a health, a healthful thing to do. So there yeah. is that aspect of it as well, that healthy thing. Yeah, Nella, you've think, got experience of the of the Greek yes. version, haven't you? No, uh, uh, the January happened for the for the first time uh, in Greece this year. It was a collaboration between uh, the January and the Greek NGO uh, called the, the Vegan Life NGO. Is the one that uh, organizes the Vegan Life Festival, uh, which is it's very successful and very big. And uh, I decided to join so I could uh, receive the emails. Uh, daily mails and um, you know uh, locate differences between um, the the British veganuary and the Greek one and see how things are going and everything and I have to say I'm really happy with it. Uh, it was not perfect, nothing is pe perfect after all, uh, but it was very well framed. Uh, it was very clear. It's not that veganism is not a diet. Uh, they had. Um, a few posts with uh, myths and truths. And the first one was myth, uh, vegan is, is a diet. So this is the, the first myth they debunked, day one. And they talked about uh, um, uh, a way of life that stands against injustice and oppression of other animals. Uh, I think the, the, the word they used was injustice and exploitation. So it was, uh, they made very clear from day one that it's not about the diet. That diet is just one aspect of the whole thing. And then um, uh, I, I got the mails, and these are the usual mails you all know about uh, vegan products, uh, what you should buy, where you can find it, uh, how you can place a cow's milk with plant milks and things like that. Uh, dietary info uh, from dietitians about um, you know, how, how to... Uh, um, to consume foods that contain all the necessary stuff we need, vitamins, etc. Um, but also, they, they, they uh, had chap whole chapters, whole mails about uh, the other animals uh, and the species we, we exploit for food. So they had all the relevant information, um, the, not just the basic one, but almost all the information uh, one should know about the exploitation of, of this um, of these beings and um, it was in a very friendly tone but uh, it was it was uh, very good and it was uh, right oriented because I remember at some point uh, there was a mail about uh, hens and eggs and um, uh, when they answered the question why not vegans do not consume eggs they said because they are not ours uh, because uh, chickens do not exist to serve uh, humans, uh, because they will have not the right to control their bodies, uh, because uh, consuming even backyard uh, eggs uh, perpetuates the uh, the idea that the other animals exist for for human sake. So they had all these you know snippets of, of, of information that uh, they pointed to the right direction, in in my opinion. Yeah, and, sounds great. Mm, that sounds yeah, really positive. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing is that uh, this NGO is, is run by uh, animal rights uh, advocates. So yeah, was, maybe that's where... That. Is, is, it, is it independent from Veganuary then? Uh, it mm -hmm. was a collaboration oh, they, because they oh, used the logo right. and everything. So it was not independent. Um, uh, but I guess they, they, they had, I don't know exactly how this happened, but they had uh, the freedom to, you know, yeah. So how, how do you think that works? How do you think that works, Anella? Do you think that um, people say like this, um, the organisation who were setting this up in Greece with the uh, vegan life? Did you say it was Vegan Life? Yes, Vegan Life Festival. Um, vegan Life, life Festival. Festival. Do they approach the organisers of Veganuary and say, "Are we allowed? You know, can we please use what your logo, your your name, your materials? What? How do you do? You have any idea of the process of how that happens and how they get to collaborate and how much freedom they get with with the branding and things?" 
uh, I'm, I'm not sure because uh, it was a collaboration because you had all the usual stuff. You you had uh, you know the, the restaurants and the supermarkets participating. The you had all the you know the vegan products, blah blah blah. Um, uh, but the the emails uh, were written from the, the the activist perspective. So I guess that they had uh, uh, a lot of freedom in, in writing those. Mm. Yeah, it's, and that's one thing that Andy was going to give us, wasn't he? Because Andy had signed up for the UK version, and so we were going to do like a comparison breakdown of of yeah. what, what the me what the messaging was in. We did send some to me, but there was not there was nothing as as much as that. But I I do get the general impression over the years. So I remember one of the Irish interviews that I did that year. There was very little in terms of animal ethics in Veganuary, the website. But I think I think. There's a lot more now, and I think, in particular, they've learned how to integrate it into their general mm -hmm. claims making with, without upsetting people. I think so. I I think that you know they've they've kind of with trial and error. I think they've found a form of words where they can have what you might call, you know, um, animal rights vegan statements within within veganery, which would have normally been mainly about the food. You know, now, I mean, obviously, we still we still get issues about things like, you know, try vegan for January. Uh, and of course, our instinct, you know, would be, well, they should be saying plant based there. Right. It's just that presumably, they, you know, they, you know, you know, veganuary is what it is. It's kind of like, it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's got it's got it's, got its name. So they're going to have to say try vegan, whereas really, yeah. from our point of view, it means try plant-based doesn't it and then we'll tell you about the ethics too yeah i wonder if i'll go ahead wendy i was only going to ask really really briefly because i want to hear more from from you but i just wonder if it might um i don't i don't know if they might have considered this and rejected this as an idea but i wonder if they might introduce other elements of veganism within that month like obviously the main thing that people are expecting is help with their dietary the dietary aspect of it and and food alternatives and all that stuff but i wonder if they do or might introduce like okay this this today could you try um you know looking at the products you're buying on the shelf of the supermarket like your your toiletries like could you go for a cruelty free and vegan option because obviously you know we 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 are opposing animal testing or could we look at um today maybe can you wear maybe shoes that are non leather today not from made from an animal skin because we oppose this you know i just wonder if there might be any of that available to them so that they can introduce just other elements just as like little seeds planted as so sort of not keeping it all about food i just wonder if i don't know if anyone would have considered that but i guess we don't know <laughs> i don't know if that was in your yours at all nella was that did that happen in, in the greek one uh, they, they had uh, a lot of <laughs> info that was not relevant to, to, to the the plant-based diet uh for example, they had a lot about, um, you know, the pollution of water, um, waterways, and um, uh, the, the, you know the relationship between uh, plant-based um, diets and uh, uh, you know uh, climate change, th things like that. So it was, it was, uh, you know, uh, the information and the education they offered was broader than just uh, uh, what we, you should eat and. and about the other mm. animals it was like uh and there was also um a, a bit of a funny uh, post saying um we oh, asked you to try uh vegan for a month but then we, we were going to ask you again on february and on mars <laughs> so uh from the beginning it was clear okay uh, the, they used the the logo the, the the you know the catchphrase try vegan for a, for a month but um yeah. it was clear from the beginning but that um we should not you should not stop at the yeah. end of the month. I think I think that's um, the same for the veganuary because I was checking out their, their Instagram and I think that's one of the things they say. What comes after veganuary? Vegan February, vegan March, and they they obviously are trying, you know, giving that same message that it's not just for January. Um, obviously, that's the the gateway. The January is the gateway, which which I suppose is even though we we say you know nothing's perfect, um, we still have to 
kind of acknowledge how much they've they've grown since they started in such a small way and how much they've they've built this brand and and I suppose one of the positives could be that that we can see it as for some people it might be a gateway into then learning the real meaning of, of veganism as well along the way that it that obviously especially like it sounds for you Nella it was quite clear from the start that sowing seeds and planting that information that this is not a diet actually we're going to help you with the diet predominantly but there's more to it and I think that could be a really positive thing yeah I do I'd agree with that um there, there definitely is this this kind of um claims about um try vegan for January and beyond now so so there's, there's, there's a lot of that right up front um which which I think is is relatively new. So as I said, I think there's a, a general kind of evolution. My, my kind of mo uh, movement question would be, um, do you think that the grassroots have been, have, have latched on to Veganuary in, in a way that that it enables them to talk about animal rights? I'd, 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 I don't see much of that. As, as I said, we've tried to do it in Ireland with the media um, but I don't, you know, you don't see a lot of people kind of building on veganuary, and I don't, I don't mean, um, I don't mean kind of doing veganuary things. I, I mean kind of like just using the fact that it's in, you know, th this is the time when, when, when journalists in particular would be more likely to cover, you know, animal-related issues uh, around that. And so, I, I'm not, I, you know, that that would be a, that would be a good thing to kind of put out in the movement that you can use mm -hmm. veganuary. To talk about um, the plight of other animals in general terms, pr precisely because the mass media are, are, are conducive to those type of stories during that month, you know, and I'm not quite sure that there's a lot of that going on, but um, it, it, it could happen. I think one of the things that stops it is the fact that a lot of people are involved with the the kind of regimented type um, activities, you know, AV and that kind of stuff, which which wouldn't kind of stray out of their uh, their little box in, in in that sense but if you think back to the times when there was much more kind of autonomous local groups like when we started wendy you know mm. those could have latched on to veganuary and used it um you know as a, yeah. spring, a springboard type of thing yeah i suppose that might be happening maybe not in such a conscious way as, as what you're suggesting, which obviously would be yeah, a great idea. Maybe there are some people out there doing it that we might not be aware of, but I suppose it's happening by default in that because of Veganuary, more of the public are more aware of the word vegan and veganism and the dietary aspect of veganism so that when they're coming across other activists, in street outreach and things like that they're already further along the line than they would have been like back in our day when people used to, what Vulcan Viking what is it <laughs> you know that that kind of thing you people wouldn't have even known what that word was whereas now it's much more mainstream and normalized in that way I suppose that's what veganuary and especially the the consumer products that are around would have brought people's awareness to it more so maybe there's a an unconscious springboarding off the back of that by activists if that makes sense yeah it could be there's a question here for you Nella um oh. from Deb um, do they promote transition foods like Beyond Meat burgers or whole food plant-based uh, diet or both? Uh, both, actually. Um, uh, they, they have very extensive meals on, uh, on a whole, uh, wholesome you know, uh, vegan diet and based on uh, uh, foods that are staples of the, of the Greek um, diet, like beans and fruits and vegetables because they are in abundance and they are cheaper than other foods here. So, uh, of course, they did that. And because they have all these dietitians uh, collaborating and chefs and uh, people presenting recipes, uh, it was like the whole thing, the majority uh, was uh, how to use everyday, everyday ingredients um, to cook vegan food. But, of course, they, they had sponsors and they had uh, foreign and vegan brands that um, make... Uh, vegan products and you know uh, all these, so it was um, easy to follow for all kinds of people, like really busy people that don't like to cook or prepare their own meals and they just want to grab something quick, or for people with families that um, would prefer to uh, to cook a very nutritious meal. Uh, it, it covered everything. 
and there yeah. are Greek brands, uh, uh, quite a few of them, that um, uh, they make now uh, Greek burgers and uh, Greek vegan burgers and uh, you know uh, souvlaki and gyros and all this traditional stuff. They they make their plant based versions version, which is uh, you know it, it's a really good answer to answer to those that are, are used to claim that we cannot you know uh, stop eating the, the traditional uh, street food. Yeah. So Nella, what? Sorry, Roger, sorry, when you gone? There you go. You go. No, I was. I was uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh yeah. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, I think. I think the um, the British version is the same in the sense that there's a mixture of, of kind of whole foods and and the more kind of vegan junk foods, if you like. Because I think there is a danger. Um, and certainly, if you go on on platforms like TikTok and everything, people seem to either suggest on purpose or believe that vegan food now is things like impossible burger and 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 all that and and that you know it, you all got to kind of remind them well actually it's a plant-based whole food uh, situation and you know and you don't have to have have the vegan junk foods you can you can you know i think it's probably because their culture is so wrapped up in in junk foods they just they just kind of see it that way you know, and that I mean, one liberating thing about veganism in general, in dietary terms, is the fact that you break free of that kind of straitjacket of you know meat and two veg or burger and chips and you know that kind of, that kind of stuff. You know, whereas I think they're just looking for a vegan version of, of it. So it's good that they've got a mixture of that, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's so true. Now that I was going to ask you, um, what what happened as you came to the end of the process? So what? Because obviously you've got all that information going all the way through. What is there any kind of follow-on or encouragement at the end to, to do anything, or how how does it kind of leave you at the end of the uh, process? The, 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 yes, there is a Facebook group that uh, you can join during the uh, during the process. And to be honest, I haven't done that, uh, so people could, could you know continue to to have uh, support and ask questions and get answers and all this to, to feel connected in uh, in a way. Yeah. So I think that's one of the most positive things about Veganure actually or anything like that is that is that support that people are getting so they're not feeling isolated they've got a bit of a community and I think one of the probably the the biggest things that maybe prevents people from from living vegan is the fact that they feel so isolated the fact that they don't have others around them who are allies or going through the same thing or they feel like they fit in with and so I think to have that support and community focus I think is such a powerful and positive thing um yeah, and also, I, I really love that there was a party uh the, the last weekend of january there was a party um uh, for the you know to to mark the end of january so there was this huge celebration of course it was in athens and this is not the the, the greek january was not limited to athens but um you cannot have parties everywhere anyway there was this this uh quite big celebration that people could join and actually go there and eat um, vegan food from um, uh, vegan uh, street joints and and meet people. So th there was this opportunity to connect in real life with, uh, with other um, people being uh, old vegans or new vegans or people that just had finished veganuary. Um, yeah. And I think this was important for those that, you know, felt that... Um, you know, may um, may be a very lonely thing to to be vegan. Mm, yeah, yeah. Actually, Jeremy's just just Not commented vegan. on on something there. Yeah. Challenge twenty two. Yeah, no, it's so, so important, isn't it, to have that that connection and and mentors and people guiding you and feeling like you've got help, someone to turn to. Because I think probably if people are isolated or they don't have help or they don't know what to do, they'll just more easily give up. Whereas if you've got that encouragement and support, I think you're more likely to continue and carry on your vegan journey, hopefully. Yeah. Mm, yeah and and Deb, Deb's picking up on the um, the junk food point that, that we, we were making. So, um yeah, it's interesting that uh, indigenous peoples are push, pushing back on that, which is, which is quite good, and, and rightly so. You would expect them to, really, wouldn't you? Because of the, you know, it's almost, it's almost like a, a version of uh, colonialism by bringing in mm -hmm. this kind of junk food diet. And just just going to transfer then to the PowerPoint, um, which goes into a couple of pages from 
of the January, but it's from last year because the this year's report's not out yet. But before before we go anywhere, Wendy, um, <laughs> when we were putting this together, you said, "Oh, that looks like the three of us." <laughs> <laughs> That's what they thought too. <laughs> so, uh, so there's going to be a big fight now to be the one in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're going to tell everybody that, though. <laughs> so I, I'm the I'm the one in the, in the middle, the downtrodden one, and you're the, you're the domineering one who's who's kind of like bully bullying the poor one in the middle. <laughs> uh, with the black the black arm, yeah. Yeah, the black arm. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Right. The, the, the expressions on their faces are price price or something. Oh, they're absolutely brilliant, aren't they? Just amazing. Yeah. I bet they're real. I bet they're real characters. Those three. <laughs> yeah, which is probably why you thought of us. I, I guess. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, celebrating the tenth anniversary. It's it's kind of like um, it's like a big NGO now. They've got loads of staff, and it looks like they they need it as well because, of course, one thing that I suppose from a grassroots point of view, you don't think of. Is the fact that you know that they are they are there presumably con conjoling or encouraging, you know, a whole bunch, hundreds and hundreds of industries to, to take up Veganuary in, in one sense or another. So all the supermarket chains, you know, all the shops, all the restaurants, the cafes, and all that kind of stuff, they're I suppose uh, from a kind of campaigner's point of view you just think oh well you know put the vegan message out there that would create the demand and then the industry will just respond to it but i suppose that response has got to be organized and i think i think that's one thing that veganuary is doing when you when you think about our job as vegans you don't think about organizing the food industry so to speak to respond to the growing demand for plant-based foods you see what i mean uh, so yeah, so um, celebrating the tenth uh, anniversary, uh, and then these are all all the kind of businesses that they uh, are talking about. And so um, the the reach is incredible. In fact, there's there's one bit of one page where it says that there's only two countries in the world which didn't have some promotion of veganery. One was wow. Vatican, Vatican City, and the other was <laughs> North, North Korea. So wow yeah so that's that, impressive yeah so that's so that's pretty good um do, 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 what is, uh, i remember when veganuary uploaded one video yeah yeah it's interesting going back to your question or, or point uh, wendy um i you see I'd, I'd be tempted for one of one of the things is to maybe get the people doing veganuary to say watch that eight minute tom reagan speech and ask people to, you know, what, what do you make of that? What do you think of the language? What do you think of the points that, that you made? Those kind of things. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so I don't I don't know whether they do that part of it, but um, that that would be great to see see that that yeah. kind of uh, thing. I mean, I don't know whether you even know the answer to that. Do you, uh, Nella? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm not sure what they could use. Uh, because they give all this information about the ways we exploit other animals. And um, at the end of the day, when you know the basic, uh, and they also have a link if you want to know more with more information. I, I think that after that, if someone uh, wants to explore veganism more, uh, they will end up you know, watching different stuff on, on YouTube and you know, accumulating more knowledge about it. Uh, but yeah. it, it would be it would be nice to you know in a way to to use a small documentary or something um, you know as yeah, well, uh, something to incorporate uh, within the emails and the, the whole thing uh, yeah you know some something that you that could nail it and make yeah, people well, think even I, more I, about it. I'd, I'd like to return to that point in a second with one of the slides that I've got. This is just really the bottom end of that certain thing. Again, you know, there's, there's, there's a heck of a lot invo involved. And so you can see why they kind of near, they need the staff and they, 
you know, yeah. it's it's gone way beyond the grassroots at, at this stage, um, in in that sense, which is what prompted me to uh, think about how the grassroots could kind of marry in with it rather than you know be be part of it in in a way. And so, going back to the point you just made, uh, Nella, this this thing here about all the kind of um, I think they call them associates. So you've got some interesting ones here, Greenpeace. Now, one one that we're liable as the animal rights show to pick out would be pro veg, right? So going back going back to that point about people exploring veganism after the event, the the danger of that is that they're going they're going to end up being being told that the the consumption of other animals is 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 a vegan thing to do, but mm -hmm. I don't suppose from veganuary that they have much choice but to kind of work with people that they might not fully align with in terms of ethics. I don't suppose it's something that they can avoid. You know, it's it's kind of got to be kind of broad church in that sense because they've got such a big job to do. You yeah. know, obviously bringing in these other kind of corporations and organisations is going to be necessary especially if they want to make it a global thing so it, it's a, a, to me it's a danger but it's an understandable one if that makes sense to anybody mm -hmm. yeah yeah it i is. would agree with that I would agree. and it is unavoidable i mean from mm. the moment uh someone decides to, to go vegan or think uh, of going vegan or, or whatever and they start looking we are we're living in we're living in the year of, of information they have easy access to all kinds of information and different approaches. So they are going to be exposed to everything and they're going to decide for themselves. And rightly so, I mean, um, we could not and we should not uh, stop that. What we could do um, is to develop a stronger uh, activist culture that would be there and would be quite loud uh, in, in the in the ways we uh, you know we want uh, other people to to think uh, in a certain way about other animals uh, and um, about veganism uh, as a way as a you know a road to liberation not a, a road to, to, to less abuse um, mm -hmm. I think this is the only way to you know to, to react and to limit this uh, danger yeah, yeah yeah that sounds like a good a good plan definitely <laughs> yeah I, I'd, I'd agree with that and i i, I think that because uh, i i tried to approach this kind of assessment of um veganuary quite positively and try and try and pick out you know the the, the pros uh, uh, as much as possible because i think it, it has moved on and, and to the extent that that there is now quite a lot of what you might call the ethical components Within veganery, they've they've either responded to previous criticisms or it's just evolved organically. But it it, it is there now, and so you know I I, th I think that if you look at veganery now, into you know from say seven years ago, it's it's pretty uh, sophisticated, it, you know, mm. even from an activist point of view. So it's kind of ticked. It's it, I, I think what I'm trying to say is it's kind of ticked the activist box. Um, a lot more than it used to in the past for me, at least. Anyhow, I don't know. What, I don't know whether it's the same for you. Yeah, look at looking at the posts on even just looking at the posts on Instagram. I'd say that because some of the posts are very much promoting a different relationship with other animals, and it's and in very much making it clear that it's not a diet and making it clear that it's not just January. So I think it's definitely moving more. It seems to be moving more in that direction, which is again a really positive thing. Just to pick up on Terry's point bought the official veganuary cookbook so terry says got a few cookbooks actually what i should really start using more i think this is a very good idea tony i think you should invite us all around for dinner <laughs> or tea <laughs> when you do so yes we're, we're all for that <laughs> yeah. yeah so so everybody who did veganuary this year wherever they are in the world you, you can turn up at terry's place and uh, he'll feed yes. you so, uh, <laughs> Right. So, um, okay. So maybe we should move on. We're going to move on to um, bully dogs. Now, mm -hmm. I believe Nella and Wendy, you know a lot more about this issue than I do. And in fact, this is one of the things that um, Andy was going to talk about because he's, as it were, he cares for one um, with a great name called Rubble. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know whether this is um, a British thing. I don't even know if it exists the same thing in Ireland. I know that Scotland is bringing in legislation. Britain's already got it, I think. I don't know yeah, about England. Mainland, mainland Europe. So this is about a particular breed of what? Pitbull Terrier, is that what we're talking about? Or? They're called American XL Bullies is the term that they've given them, but it's a very vague description, really. There are there are a lot of type of bully breed dogs, and actually Andy's dog is not an XL Bully, but was, a, I believe, a Pitbull Terrier that was on a banned list back in like 2015 or something like that something around that time so i think that's a, diff a different list but still following the same it's, still, it's pretty much the same pattern as as the more recent safeguards as they like to call them um so it started in it came into full force in england and wales the first of february i'm pretty sure it was the first of february there were kind of two phases to it the full force is from the first of february where now it's a criminal offense brian's determined to uh, get in on the action it's a criminal offense to, to so-called own or possess an xl bully dog um, in england and wales unless you've got a valid certificate of exemption and this is something that andy has actually for rubble um, and had to apply for as well but it's the same thing so it's an offense to sell abandon let the dog stray give away breed or breed from um or have an xl bully in public without a lead or a muzzle um, oh yes yeah, so that's, that's, and, that's, that's right andy's there. um yeah that's, that's, that's difficult exemption for rubble so um, yeah approximate and, date uh, of birth <laughs> <laughs> so, and so when you have that certificate of exemption you have to have third party liability as well like liability insurance and the dog has to be microchipped and you have to be able to present that certificate and the insurance within five days if you're asked by um by the police or someone representing one of those um you know kind of bodies authority bodies um so yeah and then so scotland scotland have actually they're bringing in a two-phase, again, they're calling it safeguards rather than a ban because they're saying it's not an, an outright ban because there are ex because people can get this certificate of exemption. But they're bringing it in, the first phase is the 23rd of this month, February, and then it comes into full force in July. And, th and that is mostly in response to actually the fact that because it was only in England and Wales, a lot of people have been taking dogs over to Scotland to either abandon or rehome brian's getting feisty <laughs> um he's, you're talking about dogs way too yeah, much dangerous cats, dangerous. <laughs> dangerous cats act i know honestly you'd want to make this one <laughs> um so so because people were taking dogs over there either to safety to rehome them or some people were just taking them there to abandon them and yeah just completely just dump them but because of that response from england and wales scotland have now decided to bring in similar safeguards over there because they were having to deal with the knock-on effect of all of that so because oh, they, they, were, they were being shunted geographically to there because yeah of, yeah so you're, you're answering deb's question here then yeah so it's now it's now covered the entire set of countries then really well there's no mention of um of uh ireland not your island but you know yeah Catholics, northern ireland yeah Northern Ireland, yeah. Not my island. There's no, not your island. <laughs> not your island. <laughs> my private island. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Roger owns an island, don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's very posh, very posh. I was trying to keep that <laughs> quiet. I was trying to keep that quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and the address of my um, Patreon is... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that, yeah, there's no, there's no mention. It's at the moment England, Wales and Scotland. So... I'd, yeah, no, no talk of. Uh, and is there anything like this in in Greece, uh, Nella? No, uh, there's no ban on any uh, uh, dog breed. Uh, and I, I was really surprised when I heard uh, about this uh, law in, in in England. This ban, there is not. But what it, it is interesting is the the narrative around this um, these breeds. Uh, and the the type of, of people that uh, usually do not adopt usually they buy um, uh, dog individuals belonging to, to these uh, to these breeds because these dogs are seen as as aggressive 
and usually they they are I don't want to say owned, uh, but uh, that's what they, they feel like that the people that buy this uh, individual that this ag aggressiveness is somehow related to the um, the person that you know uh, goes with the dog, uh, and usually are very much on men. And there have been accidents. There have been accidents uh, involving these dogs, um, and uh, these dogs attacking children. And when I read these stories, it's very clear to me from the facts, from the facts of for everything that happened um, that day, the account of the people that the human people that was this happening, uh, is that. Um, um, the wrong lies with the humans, not with the uh, with the dog, because the, the the dogs were restricted or restricted or abused or, or whatever, and they in a way they acted out or they were really scared and they attacked the first human um, uh, that appeared in front of them. So the, there is um, a very uh, negative narrative about these breeds, um, although there's not a ban. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, all, all dogs in Greece, uh, they need, uh, not stray dogs, of course, all, all other dogs uh, need to be microchipped anyway. This is uh, the law. So it's not about um, these large breeds. It's about every dog. Uh, and you, uh, lately, I heard a, a vet in a TV show. He was asked about uh, dogs and uh, aggressive breeds and all, all these things. And... Surprisingly, he said that uh, the, the, the breeds that are, are naturally more aggressive are not the large ones, are not the dogs we see as aggressive. This is a product of human training and, you know, in action. But uh, uh, because smaller dogs, they cannot actually uh, really harm you. Uh, well, you'll know it's the same with human the, males. Yeah. The, the small ones are the aggressive ones, aren't they? So, uh... <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's the that's the point of this as well is because XL bullies and other dogs, but obviously at the moment it's XL bullies. It's the potential they have to harm that if they are not, um, you know, if they if they do get into those situations where they're exposed to whatever the circumstances and they do react and they are they do become aggressive they can cause a lot of harm and that's the that's the point of this so they're powerful muscular dogs with with massive uh bite potential from their big jaws strong jaws and i think that is the the issue and it's why they've been discriminated against because i think i i we know what the media do they kind of take stories they make lots of money and sell lots of news from really kind of running these stories over and over and then and then looking for the stories because i'm sure there are so many other incidents with dogs around the world and especially here where the the, the bands coming into place from other dogs that are not XL bullies, but of course XL bully became like the the name, didn't it? Of like like right, let's find XL bully attacks, and because XL bullies can do a lot of damage, that's obviously what's happened, I I believe. But um, but I think what what's interest what interested me about this in particular is like yeah the na the narrative about dogs and particularly from within the movement i think it's interesting to look at it because obviously a lot of that narrative out in the world and in the media is going to come through a, an animal welfare lens or a human versus dog safety versus danger kind of lens but actually how do we look at it from an animal rights perspective because of course from our perspective as animal rights advocates all selective breeding should be banned and yet it's uh, but it's quite an interesting situation because a lot of animal advocates are very upset by the the ban and not because of the breeding as, as per se but of course because of the restrictions that have been placed on the dogs because they have to be on a muzzle they have to be on a lead out in public so that restricts their their ability to you know sniff properly uh, pan and breathe as as they would um, you can get good muzzles that allow a little bit more of that but it's still very I mean you can imagine having something on your face is quite restrictive and obviously the lead restricts freedom to just roam and run and play and things like that so of course as advocates we we can't we can't bear that because it's it's just too restrictive for their autonomy agency and freedom um but yet the breeding side of it 
we ought to really be celebrating that in a way because that's what we would want for all all breeding of all types of other animals isn't it so it's just um yeah. it's interesting it's, in that way uh it seems that whatever we do it's against them uh instead of being being in their favor could you uh, put uh, back the team's comment uh roger please about athens yes because uh, actually this this is true um it used to be like that thankfully it's not like that anymore uh you can see still packs of, of dogs uh but not mm -hmm. uh in uh, outside cities and usually are malnourished and in, in a bad state so you cannot see packs of dogs in Athens anymore because uh uh, stray uh, free living or stray dogs uh, ended up in um you know not sanctuaries but um places owned by municipalities and uh run by volunteers uh who actually try to, to find homes for for these dogs so they are not in the streets anymore but they're in there kind of institutionalized uh very few of them find uh, new homes some uh, spend um, all their lives there. So uh, um, there is still a problem. It's not visible in the streets anymore. Uh, and we, we did, didn't solve it. Um, they invisibilized it a bit. Yes. And also there have been cases lately um, of uh, dogs you know, dying from hunger in those places, um, you know, in more remote areas. Uh, so uh, it seems that... Whatever we do, uh, we do not solve a problem by, um, you know, by introducing bans or um, you know, uh, putting them in jail. Because I call this place. Some of them are quite nice, and they are by really nice people that uh, you know they offer affection and love and you know and food and, and everything. But not all of them. So uh, yeah, mm. we were trying to manage their existence and. Mm. From the moment we start doing that, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's yeah. it's down to that uh, human superintendence thing that uh, Ryder uh, talked about. But um, I mean, w Wendy, you you've kind of you're kind of living with this problem in, in in a sense, and obviously the movement. I mean, you see the memes saying the ban is at the wrong end of the leash, and we can all we can always understand that bit, right? But it also, it doesn't. I mean, you know, Nella, Nella said that if um, if other animals have got a traumatic beginning or they've been beaten, you know, etc., then then they are going to react. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, as you know, care for uh, a dog, a big dog, a powerful dog, a dog with a big jaw, a dog that's potentially could hurt someone. And he had a very difficult start to his life. He was very uh, much mistreated, neglected, abused. He had scars on his face. A cigarette burn in the middle of his face, uh, scars all over his ears, emaciated, um, just yeah, you know, yeah, just just in a terrible, terrible state. And as a result of who knows nurture and nature, because in his selective breeding as well, dogs of his breeding have been bred to be very protective. They're a guardian breed. They have in the past, they're an ancient breed as well from like ancient Greece, actually, in Ella and ancient Rome. And um, they would have been involved in fights, in wars, all these kind of things. So they, they're quite sturdy, up for it, game for it, uh, let me add them kind of dogs. And with that combination, it's a, it's a challenge, <laughs> let's say. So it's a matter of, and, and what I hear in, in with so-called dog lovers what they say all the time there's a real cliche that they churn out which is and it goes back to what Nella was just saying there is the um, it's it's not the fault of the the dog it's always the human and I think all the issues that dogs are facing today navigating this human world is all down to us I'm sure you know I know we've created the problem we've created the selective breeding we've we're making them fit into our human world in a certain way dictating well, we, that every we've, move we've bred the problem haven't we we've, we've, we've bred, bred the problem the yeah but be, but because of that we ha we have got issues that we do have to deal with like the likes of Dylan who has to be on a yeah and Jeremy's right we we need to look at different words for muzzles and leads because they're quite horrible really they're quite speciesist but for want of a better word for now Jeremy will definitely look into this and chat about this um it's um 
you're left with trying to help this individual to have the best life they can within very difficult circumstances and a very anxious, reactive, fearful state that they might be in when they're going out or mixing. And you're just trying to navigate as best you can. But with that said, you can't train everything out of them. You can't control everything. You can't change their personality or get rid of their traits. So you're just navigating and and doing your absolute best in each situation. So it's not always that the human isn't doing everything they can. So I've I've kind of shifted my perspective a lot since since living with Dylan actually mm. um, and realized that you can't do everything as as you would like to do and sometimes you just it's, have it's to do a heck things. It's a recipe isn't it Wendy when you think you've got a traumatized scared other animal who's weaponized mm. by breeding. Yeah. That, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. a hell of a recipe for for um, things to go wrong isn't it? Yes. Yes, 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 it is. It's a hell of a responsibility and not one to be taken lightly. And it's it's taken a lot of um, soul searching and uh, yeah. of sacrifice, a lot of, yeah, to, and, just and to... make a good point just about, just about the so-called muzzles because many just buy the cheapest ones. And, of course, you know, that would probably not be the best fit, as it were. So if, if they've got to have these goddamn things, then at least mm. they ought to be well-fitted and... Because, you know, like you say, if the, if a dog can't sniff and lick and all that kind of stuff, I mean, that's a lot of their dogness gone when they're out. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's and that's what's so awful for this this kind of blanket safeguarding on the XL bullies, because a lot of those dogs would never show aggression, will never show aggression, have never shown aggression. And yet they're all being tarred with the same brush as it were they're all being like said right you've all got to wear muzzles because I think the potential is okay well we don't know which ones are going to be aggressive and, and unsafe so we have to just like make them all wear these restrictive face well, well I actually um there is a there is a bunch of mammals that I I could think of that would that would be a quite a good policy so all uh men <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you might be saying going to yeah, say that <laughs> should be muzzled with a straight jacket uh, until <laughs> we can find out if they're going to behave themselves. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. By the way, well, welcome, we Andy. I see, I see you made it on your phone. So uh, we we we've missed you a great deal. We've done a lot of padding and waffling uh, to to fill in the gap, but we've we've managed to get through to the hour. In fact, we've got two minutes, folks. So do anybody want to make um, last minute statements or? You're mute. You're, you're muted um, now. I have a quick question. Uh, have there been that many incidents of uh, these uh, large breeds attacking attacking people, human people in, in in Britain? So they had to introduce the ban. Where does this come from? What the the inc? You mean the incidents? I I I believe that obviously the the things are happening for sure. But I think once the it seems like once the media picked up on that, yeah, media it just, hype, it, just it? it was really hyped up. And then, of course, politicians get on board and think, think like, oh, I have to step in and act like I can change something because they can't do anything about all the rest of the shit show that's going on in the country and the and beyond. So they go, right, let me control something that we can and let's let's like appease the people if they're getting all, you know, they the media whip people up, the politicians come in and, and give a solution. And I think that's pretty much for me what's what's happened. Um, yeah, that's that's what I would say. But it is so. I, I can see the potential there for for these dogs to do harm, but then the, the, the complete blanket discrimination is not fair and probably not effective. It's got a whole ripple effect going on, and then the people who like the big, um, kind of more kind of protective breeds are just going to go for a different breed of dog now until they're put on the list because like Andy's here with Rubble that was from a previous banned list now this is a new one with Exo Bullies and then maybe in another five ten years there'll be another breed put on, onto that list because a similar thing will be happening because it's, it's just an really ongoing kind of, problem. Kind of fashion thing going on as well isn't it I mean it used to be Alsatians, German Shepherds then Doberman Pinchers and and then the kind of more fighting looking uh, dogs, right, and so the, it, the, these things go in in fashions, don't don't they as well? So, yeah. like you say, if if um, if if they ban, they'll go 
they'll go for somewhere else, presumably. Yeah, yeah, they will. They'll just go somewhere else. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah designer dogs. The, they've said designer so dogs. Cool. Yeah, you see, the whole thing is just a, a complete problem in itself, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I, but I think I think just just for my my final statement would be just just with um, kind of dogs generally and as our as animal advocates in terms of our relationship, I think we ought to be just be mindful of not kind of promoting like breeds of dogs and normalizing this practice because of course like breed specific whether it's discrimination or admiration is kind of like akin to kind of racism and planned breeding for certain qualities in dogs or any other animal is akin to like human eugenics which was popular in the early 20th century but hopefully now most people would see that as abhorrent and it's just you know I think we ought to kind of not normalize that by by promoting breeds and also just practicing encouraging relationships with dogs that are respectful and don't diminish their dignity so that you know they're not fur babies they're not our surrogate children and our babies they're not teddy bears um i think we ought to avoid like infantilizing them avoid patronizing and cutifying them um and even and remember also we also need to remember as well that even the dogs we care for are still captive that they're not they're not in a state of liberation they're still captive so it's not like we shouldn't hold them up as oh why love dogs and eat the other it's like why, why are we holding dogs up as the as the liberated uh you know ideal they're not they're absolutely not so we need to stop framing things in that way as well and i think we just need to be constantly mindful of creating space for dogs agency other animals too i'm just giving the example of dogs because we've been talking about them but agency autonomy privacy they need their privacy they need their dignity as a person in their own right and to remember they are not our pets and we need to foster relationships that are different to those who see them as pets so we need to like you know be very mindful of, of what we're doing how we're behaving in that relationship i think that would be my final say hmm. sounds like we need a, a new radical relationship with with uh, other animals <laughs> Yeah, so um, oh, yes, Andy said that uh, he's got a poem for me on 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 YouTube about rubble. I um, until I found until I discovered the story of rubble, I thought Andy must be a Flintstones fan, but it, it turned out not to be that. Not to be <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Barney Rubble. Yeah, I thought, yeah. yeah, I thought it was Barney Rubble. Yeah, so uh, I was wrong. I was wrong about that. <laughs> uh, right, people. Well, we're at the end of our time. Uh, thanks very much for uh, tuning in, and um, so we're we're determined, aren't we, team? Yes. Yes. We're saying this live live on air with every listening people that uh, <laughs> we're hoping to uh, to definitely come back every fortnight at least. Well, that's for every fortnight, isn't it? So. Yes. Yeah. So are, are we are we out of sync now? So do we have to come back next week to go back into it or what? No, because February is it's a leap year this year, isn't it? So we've got a longer February. And so therefore it's not Monday, I believe, next. Uh, right. OK, I think it's still February next Monday is what I mean. So then we're back the one after. Well, if, you, if you're going to get technical like leap years and stuff, you, you've lost. <laughs> 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 yeah, I haven't got a clue about that type of thing. All right, then, folks. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for coming we'll and for all the comments. In, uh, and uh, Yeah, in a fortnight. So uh, bye for now, everyone. Bye, bye. Thanks.